Et voilà. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is four minutes past the starting time. So we are going to get started by thanking you for joining us to talk about protecting the right to education in the eastern part of DRC. A few words before the welcome address is to remember that you need to make sure that your microphone is muted throughout the presentation. You will also be able to participate in the last part, and that's when you would then be able to turn on your microphone. So turn off your microphone, put your phones on silent mode. You may also ask your questions in the chat box at any point in time. You may also use the icon to raise your hand before you take the floor. This would enable us to proceed in an orderly fashion. So don't forget, you can use the icon to raise your hand in the toolbar below. This event is available in French and English. So you have the option to click on the globe icon. You have the icon in the toolbar at the bottom part of your Zoom screen. Let me also add that this session is recorded. Our presentations, content, resources, tools, and links will be shared following this meeting on the same page. That is the page INEE.org. Next slide, please. Very good. So the objectives. Objective of this meeting is to raise awareness on the situation in Eastern DRC and how it's affecting education, particularly fulfilling the right to education. The idea is that we are here to support members of INNE and to build their community in education in emergencies. So we're going to listen to key stakeholders in the education sector. We'll then see who will take the floor next. I also wanted to add that this event is very important for us because it is one of the major functions of INEE, which is to bring together the stakeholders and have their voices heard. So today we're going to have hear the voices of actors and people who make up the education community in emergencies. That is why we have prepared for people to make presentations live and there are others that have been pre-recorded. This would also promote the accessibility and inclusion of these voices that we often do not hear because they do not have the technical access or sometimes maybe due to security issues, they are unable to move to get internet access. This was an important point that I wanted to mention at the beginning of the session we are going to look at the next slide, please. Good. This webinar will be in three parts. Introduction, within which we are going to take stock of the situation in DRC. Then we'll move on to the protection component, protection in education. And then we'll look at the continuing education opportunities as well as the needs. And that's when you'd be able to take the floor. So I'm Emilien Marchas, I'm the facilitator of the French language community in Guinea. And I would soon give the floor to Dean Brooks, the director of AINI. And then we have Jonas Habimana, Gilberta Marie, and a testimony in this part. I would come back to the roles of everyone as we make progress. Dean, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Emmeline, and, and thank you everyone who has joined. I'm happy to see uh, so many IE members uh, and partners on today's call. Several weeks ago, IE members in the RC reached out uh, to the Secretariat and asking to really highlight uh, the need for education in emergencies in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. INEE believes that one way in which we can achieve collective impact is through the collective action as represented by today's meeting. 
As one of INE's key functions, we provide a platform for our members' voices to be shared and heard. In support of INE's mission to uphold the right to education in all languages and all, I'm sorry, my screen just said to confirm my speaking language. Can you understand me, Emily? Okay. <laughs> But really, in support of our, our mission to support the right to education, in all circumstances, today's event really provides a chance to learn from INE members who are working to ensure that the right to education is upheld in Eastern DRC. So this webinar, as Emmeline says, brings together a wide range of actors and stakeholders who will be sharing their experiences. It'll be a chance for us to learn from each other. And it's hoped that those on this call and the webinar today will find ways to collaborate and support each other further in addressing the urgent needs faced by the children and young people there. I would like to just say thank you to INE members for calling our attention to this issue. Um, and just uh, to really thank you for your continued support in response to education and emergency needs in really difficult times. Your work, dedication, and perseverance really are an inspiration to everyone on this call. I, I will hand over now because I want us to get started and, and really take a moment to listen to everyone. Um, so thank you, Emmeline, back to you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Dean. Merci d'avoir... Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you very much for giving us your time out of your busy schedule. So as I was saying, it's a participatory webinar that is born out of a response based on requests from members of NDRC who are identified by the French language community. And there's a member who is named Jonas Habimana, who is the executive director of BFEP, but also the focal, INE focal point in DRC. And his term would conclude very soon in April. Jonas pre-recorded a video for us and we are going to play it. So we can go ahead and play the video of Jonas. I'm Jonas Abimana from the, Republic of Con the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm a displaced person site here in DRC and not cool. Since February, the situation in the region has become very complex. Uh, thousands of people displaced as a result of armed conflict. There are also problems of uh, protection and education, and this is a problem today because a lot of children cannot really go to school. And it also is linked to protection because children who cannot go to school are spending the whole day in camps without supervision, without hope. And this is a real protection problem, especially because a lot of schools have been occupied by displaced people. There are schools that have been attacked by armed groups. And so this is a real need for education that we have here. We are therefore asking all our partners that they should really support us to see how we can make a high level plea to improve children's education, particularly children who are unable to finish the school year, when very soon we're going to get to the exam period. Teachers need to be trained and we need temporary classrooms that should be set up. And why not also rehabilitate classrooms in areas where people are returning? Really, this is a real opportunity for us to make a special appeal to everyone to support the education sector and particularly protect children during this difficult period. Thank you very much. Very well, thank you very much, Jonas, for this recording that really helps us to set the tone with regards to protecting children, right to education, and also an appeal to support education in emergencies. Now we are going to give the floor to our colleague from UNICEF, Madame Gilbert Amari, who is the National Coordinator for Education Sec Cluster in DRC. So Gilbert is going to present to us the latest data gathered by the cluster and give us uh, a summary of the needs of the education needs. So Gilbert, is your microphone working? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Emeline. Good morning to all partners of INE present. 
it's truly a pleasure for us to be here for the education cluster to present the situation in drc i am gilbert ambari the national coordinator of the education cluster the presentation outline as seen on the screen here would enable us to present the humanitarian context the impact of crisis and humanitarian consequences some key information on our planning our response strategies and challenges that we need to overcome as well as the key messages i would like to share with you next slide please so in the drc you should know that uh, we live in a complex context with a lot of emergencies we have armed conflicts natural disasters epidemics pandemics and so on and so forth all of this that then come together in the same area generally speaking and in some areas you could have epidemics or even national natural disasters without necessarily having armed conflicts but in the east you have all of this phenomena happening at the same time and so in 2024 more than half of the population of drc or almost a quarter of the country's population faced really high multi-sectoral needs and about 14 million children were impacted and this included 3.6 million displaced children among these children we had more than 7.8 million children that are of school age that is between 6 and 17 that were affected now generally speaking next slide please the next slide really gives us the breakdown can you can you hear me so this really gives us the breakdown per age and gender we have please can we come back can we come back to the incidents on schools now in schools in 2023 we had 848 schools that were closed and towards the end of 2023 in december about 242 schools were reopened which means we still have 606 schools that remain closed the results if you have children who still do not have access to schools due to the crisis, natural disasters that have led to schools being closed. In the courses of for school closure, if you compute the data, you see that almost 92% of schools that are closed is due to armed conflicts, while about 9.2% uh, due to act of God. Next slide, please. Now, while on the one hand, we had problems that were resulting from armed conflicts, here, this shows you what's going on in schools. We have cleaning that is underway. Uh, schools that are affected by natural disasters, flooding that has happened. Do you also have whirlwinds that have really affected the infrastructure? Here you have more than 1,600 schools that are affected by natural disasters across the country, affecting more than 760,000 more than 560,000 children with more than half being girls. Next slide, please. Now, out of all of this, we have then found that we have schools that are in really serious problems, schools that are attacked or occupied, schools that are flooded with schools being destroyed, 
with documents lost, with wastewater in classrooms and even solid waste. So it's a hygiene problem. You also have overcrowded classes compared to the national standard sets. For instance, here at the little edge of the screen, you have about 99 children in a classroom. Whereas the standard is we should not have more than 55 children in a classroom. So we have almost twice the recommended size, recommended number of children in the classroom vis-a-vis -vis the national standards. You also have schools that have been used as shelters by displaced people, sometimes due to armed conflict, sometimes due to natural disasters. As a result, here you then have children that are out of school, children that are left unprotected, that is, you may find them resulting in being recruited in armed groups, kidnapping, forced labor, gender-based violence, drugs, early pregnancies, and even negative survival mechanisms and preventable diseases. What do we mean here by negative survival mechanisms? You're seeing youths, adolescents here, who then go into sex work for survival. And this really happens in environments where people have been affected because they do not have the means to ensure that they continue to meet their needs. And they also do not have schools to attend. Next slide, please. Some key data that we have here. Now, because we do not have enough funding, for instance, this year, regarding our targets, we know that education in emergencies should cover children aged 3 to 17. We have then realize that we are unable to consider children aged three to five because we do not have enough partners and we do not have funding available to work in this segment. Okay. So, by prioritizing we have then arrived at a need of 842,000 children that are in need for education, and about 646,000 children or partners. And we should also note that this is a result of prioritization. Now we've used the minimum standards for these children if nothing is done, they will be completely left out of school. They would not be able to go to school if they do not get the support. The need is much higher than what is here, but we've had to prioritize. Next slide, please. Gilbert, you have two minutes left to touch on the strategy. Okay, so in terms of strategy, we have three components, access, quality, and governance. And we work to mobilize communities for the return and retention of children in school. We try to organize courses for them, receipt courses. We try to strengthen their capacity to access to schools. And we try to rehabilitate, rehabilitate schools. We try to improve functional literacy. We try to distribute kids teaching materials. We build the capacity of teachers and stake actors because this is very important. With this, we'd be able to ensure that we boost system resilience. We also try to set up radio education programs and a safe school approach and psychosocial support for 
children and even teachers as well as advocacy here we try to ensure that we have close collaboration with other sectors as well as the support for development nexus because we try to ensure that we are able to strengthen institutional capacities to truly make the system resilient so we have uh, training of partners, contingency stock, support for the development of a national strategy for education in emergency situations. All of this brought together. What are the objectives of our cluster? Can you move on to the next slide, please? We have three objectives of the cluster. Next slide, please. We've almost finished. We need to ensure that we have inclusive and equitable access to quality education in a safe and protective learning environment for children who would have gone from zero to six months and children, displaced children from about six months to a year old. For them, we want to truly ensure that they have access to quality and inclusive and equitable education. The third objective is that we want children aged 6 to 17 to be protected from abuse, sexual abuse, exploitation, as well as gender-based violence in schools. And so this is a package of activities that are aimed at protecting and safeguarding children in school. All of these contribute to other objectives. The key messages that we want to get across is that we have more than 4 million primary school children that were enrolled for the 2023-2024 school year. But due to the conflict, they are at risk of losing their school year if nothing is done. So the children need us. We still have in this year, as at February or about in March 2024, we had more than 1,000 schools that were closed due to conflicts and natural disasters. We are therefore calling for the contribution of everyone. Now, can you just give me 30 seconds to touch on our opportunities for collaboration with INE? This is our organization together. We want to continue discussing on emerging subject matters. Here we're talking about impacts of climate change on education, accountability, localization. We also want to continue building the capacity of cluster partners on these different subject matters, climate change, mental health, inclusive education, peace education, and conflict-sensitive education. Of course, with INEE, we hope that we'll be able to continue to get support for production of provincial level advocacy tools because the country is really vast. And so we hope that we would be able to, of course, our provincial cluster would be able to get content or would be able to look at how to make content for fact sheets, bulletins, um, videos, and so on and so forth. And we are also calling on partners here to advocate for emergency find funding with uh, DRC. Thank you very much for your kind attention. We'll now move to the item on the protection of the right to education, multi-sectoral and interagency approach. And I will give the floor to Alison Joyner, who is an EIE consultant. Alison recently worked for the Alliance for the protection, for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action and INEE for a consultation. She now works with Plan International. 
United Kingdom, and she works on gender analysis reports in Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Nigeria. This project is funded by Education Cannot Wait to pilot a toolkit on gender analysis. Alison will present the importance of uh, a multi-sectoral and interagency approach to child protection in humanitarian action. This will give us a good basis to continue the discussion on this topic. Alison, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. A slide should be projected on the screen. I'm delighted to make a few remarks on the connection between education and child protection. In case you don't know, this, uh, this um, guidance note was developed by the Alliance of Child Protection in Humanitarian Action and INEE. The guidance note aims to support the work of education and child protection practitioners responding to the needs of children and adolescents in humanitarian crisis. These actors include government ministries, national and international NGOs, UN agencies, and donors. The situation in the DRC is clearly a protection crisis, which cannot be isolated from, the, from that of access to safe education. Can we have four clicks? The guidance note entitled Supporting Integrated Child Protection and Education Programs in Humanitarian Action. Four clicks. Has its roots in the two minimum standards manuals for child protection from the Allies and for education in emergencies from INEE, as we can see on the screen. I would like to draw your attention to the two models used for the two manuals. Can we go back to the previous slide? The socio-ecological model on the left for minimum standards on child protection places the child at the core of uh, his or her environment, first the family, then the community, society, and cultural norms transmitted in, the, in its context. On the right, we see the INEE domains, which represents a comparable model from the education perspective. Community participation around access to school, partly depending on families, then teaching and the system that impacts this teaching. We know, even if it's not explicit, that access to quality education is also affected by society and sociocultural norms. If we look on the right of the guidance note to elucidate the interconnections between education and child protection, the guidance note presents a version of the social ecological model with the school inserted to show overlap between the two models and sectors. The note is organized by programmatic areas referenced in page 19, each covering a shared vision of integrated programming, guiding questions, indicators, resources, and examples. The domains are al aligned with the domains and standards of the Alliance and INEE minimum standards for education. The most common references being to INEE minimum standards of education, namely access and learning environment, and more especially the second standard protection and well-being. And in the minimum standards for child protection, the uh, 30, 23rd standard on education and child protection of the Alliance. Next slide.
like Emeline just indicated, a consultation has just been complicated, completed to inform the next steps for the joint initiative between the Alliance and INEE, including the promotion and use of the guidance note. One of the main recommendations of the respondents this consultation was to strengthen a spirit of empowered partnership between education and child protection stakeholders. This includes, of course, teachers and social services and child protection staff. We developed this graphic still in draft to represent the collaboration and socio-ecological model involving the two se sectors and will accompany a small selection of key resources with the guidance note. At the heart of the graphic on the left, we see once again the child and the adolescent focusing on their protection, well-being and learning, reflecting their rights to education and protection. We could also put rights at the center, human rights. The program areas on the right represent the most common areas of work in integrated child protection and uh, education in emergencies. These domains with the cross-cutting considerations around them, namely participation, coordination, advocacy, evidence, and learning, reflect the socio-ecological model, taking into account the shared vision of the two sectors, intersectionality and the operational spaces of integration. Next slide, please. In DRC, Section 4, Safe Access and Safe Learning Environments of the Guidance Note will be particularly relevant, protect, protecting education from attacks, mental, protecting mental health and psychosocial support with social and emotional learning and gender-based violence, particularly in schools. Gilbert mentioned issues around gender-based violence. We hope that one outcome of the consultation will be leveraging resources to support the use and improvement of the guidance note in contexts such as DRC. Last slide, please. In conclusion, I would simply like to highlight two additional resources. The framework for collaboration in child protection and education in emergencies on the left with its summary guide, which was developed by the education cluster with the child protection subcluster. It is very complementary to the guidance note because it focuses on collaboration in coordination. For those of you who read English, because unfortunately it has not yet been translated in French, the documents we see on the right are a learning summary which has just been published in March 2024 and good practices in gender mainstreaming and gender-based violence risk mitigation in education. The DRC case study describes how the education cluster in the DRC has established key objectives and indicators that integrate measures to mitigate gender-based violence into education responses for the country. Like we saw in Gilberta's slide, we saw how this was shaped. We also want to tackle child protection. Now I would like to hand over to those who do the real work in the DRC. Thank you very much, Alison. And I hope we will listen to our colleagues who work on the field. I hope videos will work this time around. A little summary of what our colleague from World Hope Givers was saying, he was talking about the great insecurity which pushes many people to displace. Students move to safer zones. 
he was identifying 40 schools which were displaced in his sector due to insecurity. He also mentioned the fact that schools were organized in homes, but this led to additional charges, financial charges for the government. He was also talking about the limited intake capacity because classrooms were overcrowded, teachers were facing huge challenges, students were forced to adapt, but also the teachers need to adapt to students' new needs in terms of protection and school objectives. This is a summary of what our colleague Enoch was telling us. We'll now move to the protection of schools in North Kivu with the participation and intervention of Mariam Touré, who is a colleague who is the regional advisor for humanitarian advocacy at Save the Children. She is in charge of uh, West and Central Africa. I'll add that Save the Children is a member of the steering committee of uh, GCPEA, the Global Coalition for the Protection of to protect education from attacks. And Mariam will discuss a workshop she facilitated in January 2024 on uh, safe school spaces in Northern Kivu. Mariam, I hope you're, can, you're online. Hi, Emilia, I hope you can listen to me loud and clear. Yes, I can. Can you please switch on your video? I will come back two minutes before the end of your presentation. Thank you. I've switched on my camera. I hope you can see me. Yes, we can see you and we can hear you clearly. And I'm happy that you were able to join. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to participate in this meeting and thank and I thank INEE for inviting me. Like she said, in this presentation, I will somehow dwell or I will somehow focus on a workshop we organized in Goma on uh, safe school spaces in Northern Kivu. My presentation will be outlined as follow. I will briefly talk about the history of uh, the SSD, Safe School Declaration in DRC. Before drawing the context in Northern Kivu and focusing on key elements or key outcomes of the out of the workshop organized in Goma. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Before coming back to the history, there are people who do not understand what is SSD, the Safe School Declaration. This document was developed following an observation, we realized that across the world, when there are conflict schools, who, which are supposed to be sanctuaries of education, were increasingly targeted by armed groups. After this acknowledgement, the government of uh, Norway and Argentina decided to support the development of a document, a declaration which will be proposed to states and which will be requested to sign to make the commitment to protect their schools from attacks. That is how the Safe School Declaration came into being and was open to, signat to signature after the 2015 first conference of Oslo on uh, securities in schools. To date, 19 states have signed the declaration worldwide, including DRC. Next slide, please. One year after the signing of the, the, the opening of the declaration to signature, DRC signed it and made the commitment 
to follow all the guidelines, namely protecting schools from armed groups, the securitization of schools, and uh, the identification of authorities to, to protect schools. Following this, a workshop was organized to discuss this. Unfortunately, since the organization of this roundtable and the signature of this declaration, not many things were done to ensure the protection of schools. And it is after that that Save the Children decided to organize the workshop we organized in Goma. Next slide, please. What is the situation of schools in northern Kivu? We realized that there was an upsurge of attacks against schools since the beginning of 2024. Several schools were attacked and 24 were occupied by armed groups. We also realized that 189 schools were closed due to insecurity, namely direct attacks or the the uh, atmosphere of fear in the area due to the conflict, which pushes schools to be closed as preventative measures. Also, many people testified that they were that they were victims of uh, horrible acts due to this conflict. Next slide, please. So it was uh, as a result of this acknowledgement that in partnership with other organizations, we decided to organize a workshop on the protection of schools in Northern Kivu. But mainly this was a reflection workshop on uh, the uh, Safe School Declaration and how it could be improved in the RC. Next slide. The workshop was held over two days from the 30th to the 31st of January 2024 and aimed at, at exploring the problem, deepen specific issues related to SSD implementation. 35 people participated in this meeting, especially provincial representatives of uh, armed forces in the TRC. Repre the representative of the governor and uh, local and international NGOs. Next slide. Following the workshop, we noticed that the workshop was relevant to observe the situation for all those who were present, they didn't know much about the Safe School Declaration. And uh, this was very alarming because it is supposed to be one major document to increase the protection of schools. And the fact that many participants indicated that they were not familiar with this concept was one major outcome of the discussion. We also discussed the dynamic or the momentum among all our partners in the area. MRM was the was the main actor supported by UNICEF and MONUSCO. We also noticed during discussions that there were coordination challenges and synergy among actors. As far as data collection and implementation of SSD are concerned, the workshop also gave us the possibility to make commitments Following this workshop, a roadmap was developed by participants and uh, each participant in their respective roles decided to draft a key plan 
of action to make sure the safe school declaration was implemented in schools. They also made concrete commitments to support this implementation while underlying their needs, which were common to several key uh, to several stakeholders. Another outcome was the need to have a better coordination among education actors be the provincial, so provincial and international actors. The workshop gave us the opportunity to see how important this synergy was to fast track the implementation of the safe school declaration in schools and the uh, protection of schools as a whole. Next slide. All right, I think it was uh, brief. I thank you for your kind attention and uh, I look forward to answering your questions after this um, event. I hope I kept to time. Thank you very much, Mariam. You perfectly kept to time. If you have questions, you can already write them in the chat and we'll address them later. We talked about the protection of schools. We talked about threats in, in schools. And there is also the issue of recruitment, the fact that children are used by armed forces and groups. We will attempt once again to play a video. This time around, it's a video which was shared through an organization named Action pour la Restauration de la Paix et de la Justice. And the uh, testimony was collected by Isaac. The testimony is uh, from a young girl. Due to evident reasons of protection of minors, the testimony is anonymous. The young girl tells her story in an armed group's camp, and uh, she is talking to Winnie Kamanga, who is a child protection officer. I will see if we can play the video. Unfortunately, there is no sound. In South Kivu, in DRC, due to the vulnerability situation of her family, she's left idle. Hi, my daughter. Can you tell us about your story? I am a girl. I am a 15-year-old year old girl once when i was coming back from school i saw five people coming my way the armed people the armed men told me where are you going from and where are you where are you coming and where are you going to they told me they will take me to their camp to meet their commander i asked them why they told me that i should not argue because they were armed they forcibly took me to their camp. When the command, the commander saw me, he said he wanted a virgin girl. I told him that I'm still a girl and I need to continue my studies. The commander told me to not argue that I would stay at the camp and I will be, get married to his son. I told the commander that I don't want to get married. I want to continue my studies. Unfortunately, the commander did not accept. And eight months later, I saw people who came to raise the awareness of the commander, telling him that the place of a young girl is not at an armed group, group camp, but in a school. That is how the commander released us. We were 31 children. Unfortunately, my father and my mom 
were killed in the bushes by armed men. What do you need now that you're back in a family? I want to continue my studies to help my siblings and my community. Because we are orphans. I also plead with you to save or to rescue other children who are still in those camps. Okay, I saw your comment on the quality of the sound. Unfortunately, we worked on it before. Maybe at your level, what you can do is to increase the volume. I will send a script for reference later on. This was just to illustrate the story of this young girl. I will now give the floor to Sandra Mignon. Let me take back my notes. Mignon works for Plan Canada. She's co-lead of the um, CAFAC working group, which means child associated to armed forces and armed groups as a member of the alliance. Without further ado, I will give you the floor, Sandra, to discuss these very relevant thematic, especially for the DRSD. Thank you, Emeline. Thank you all. I will talk about CAFAC. I will use the acronym all through. I hope you already know what it means. It is a child protection problem, which is acute in the DRC and uh, which has lasted for s several decades. It's not new. The latest figures of the United Nations report 2022 indicated that 1,545 children were recruited, among which 1,293 boys and 252 girls. And this is just a partial representation of the reality because these were the children who were identified and documented according to the United Nations rules. We can imagine that the number is even bigger than this. I would also like to draw the difference between young girls and young boys. It is a child protection issue. We see that mostly young boys are recruited among armed forces, but there is an increasing number of girls who are also recruited by armed forces and which, who should not be overlooked. Today, I will discuss the interconnection between education and child protection. The link is multi-pronged. When we talk about the recruitment of children in armed forces, we make the distinction between prevention which aims at preventing their recruitment, the release phase where the children are rescued from these groups. It can be formal or formal or informal. Formally is when they undergo a whole process which involves the authorities and armed forces of the country. And there is the informal release where the children will leave the um, camp by themselves. And there is the reintegration phase. Here we intervene to ease the children's reintegration in their family and community settings. Throughout the process, we are active in prevention and reintegration. I will give some examples. There is a strong link between education and the recruitment of children. Access to education is uh, a prevention element because we know that children who go to school run are less likely to be recruited than those who are out of school. But for this to happen, education and the school space need to be safe. And it's not always the case if school is if the school is uh, closer uh, or is close to a checkpoint where there are armed forces and children, it can lead to recruitment. When children go to school, they can be recruited like this girl said, she was recruited when she was going to school. The road to school should also be 
secured. Now, as far as or with regard to reintegration, education is also very important. It enables children to normalize their environment, to make this transition between a military identity to a civil identity. In the case of DRC, young girls explained how the fact that having a, the fact that having a diploma or completing their studies enabled them to recover some value. The fact of being a member of armed group, having sexual relationships had led to a depreciation in quotes of uh, their value and they were not considered, uh, they were only considered as, um, they were not considered credible by members of their community. Going back to school and having a degree made them recover their value and be accepted, accepted in their communities. You see the link between education and recruitment of uh, young children. I can discuss this for forever, but we do not have enough time. I will also talk about some resources which we developed. Next slide, please. Several tools and resources were developed in our working group on CAFAC. There is a toolkit on guidelines on CAFAC with an entire component on education. We developed the latest technical fact sheet on education for CAFAG, which you can access on our website. We also developed a technical fact sheet on livelihoods for CAFAG. It's very important and it is, and it is often part of reintegration programs. We often oppose education to livelihoods because children are faced with the choice between formal education and livelihoods, like learning a trade or launching a small business. So we want children to have access to both because both are complementary. We also drafted a technical fact sheet on girls. Like I earlier said, girls are often overlooked in CAFAC programs. So we developed this technical fact sheet, which lays emphasis on their specific needs with an array of recommendations on how to meet their needs. In the toolkit, there is a MOOC, which is uh, an online learning opportunity on how to develop CAFAG programs. It is in French. It is a six week training course of six hours per week where you have exercises and lectures on how to develop a CAFAG program. I also invite you to join our online community of practice, which is a space where you can ask questions, have access to all resources around CAFAG. Everything is uh, translated automatically in the language you want, so it's available in French. We also have our YouTube channel, which we launched with the working group. You can see on this channel our French playlist with all the webinars, the activities and the learnings we had on CAFAC. I guess the links to all these uh, materials are sent in the chat box. Thank you, Natalie. Do not hesitate to reach out if you would like to learn more about the working group and uh, the different materials which we have developed. Thank you very much, Sandra, for this uh, brilliant and straightforward presentation. I will like to reassure you that we'll send a link the materials will now watch a video, an anonymous testimony by a, an ARPG coordinator. So we are going to listen to the video. We are in Calais where we are meeting a field worker 
who would tell us some of the activities he organizes for children affected by armed conflict in the east of DRC. I am a field worker of the Action for the Restoration of Peace and Justice. I work with children who have been pulled and are working with armed groups. I also work with children who have lost their families and also displaced. The organization campaigns to promote rights and education of children affected by armed conflict. We specifically work in areas that are affected by humanitarian crisis in Eastern DRC. So how does your project help to protect these children that are affected? Our project helps these children affected by conflict because we focus on protecting and educating these children. There hasn't been a month where we organized a joint mission to verify and remove children associated with armed groups in Kalehe and in the southern Kivu, where we managed to release 272 children and they have been taken back to their families and are gradually integrating despite difficulties. What are the some, of, some of the educational activities that you offer these children after they have left the armed groups? Uh, children who have been freed from these armed groups um, are offered a chance to to go back to school because reintegration them into school is uh, sustainable reintegration that is why we after we recover these children from armed groups we advise them to go back to school we try to reinsert them into the school system so that they can be functional members of their community for their family and for the country what are some of the needs? What do we need to do to prevent children from going back to the armed groups? Well, children who have come out of these armed groups have a lot of needs. And not just children that are associated with them, but even displaced children. Even children who have been lost. They have different needs, and this includes they need to go back to school, they need school, kids, they need family health care, they need uh, water, sanitation and hygiene, they need shelter, psychosocial care to re-establish their mental health. And they also need they need medical support, as I just pointed out. What therefore are some of the advices that you give to teachers that are looking after these children? Okay, what we tell the teachers who are supervising these children in their class is first of all to try and bear with the children who have been used and who have been handling weapons and fetish in the bush. We advise them to take them just as they do other children in the community. As an organization, we help the teachers to build the capacity in order to continue to strengthen the psychosocial care of these children because it's not easy. A child who has worked and has been used for with an armed group for one year, he has been using weapons. It's not easy for them to then go back to reading books, to handling pen and writing materials. So this is what we advise the teachers. Thank you very much. Okay, so this was the testimony that will enable us to understand how, of course, through the support of certain organizations, how they try to reinsert and reintegrate children into the community, just as Sandra mentioned in her presentation. So we talked about protecting the right to education. You may also use the uh, standard 
of INE, we're going to standard number two, which is on protection and well-being. Standard number three on institutions and services, which, of course, are very useful for your activities. Now we are going to move on and we're going to talk about continuous education and needs. We're going to look at some actors in DRC, a local ONG and an international NGO, of course, Danish Refugee Council. So we are going to listen to the video of Jonas Habimana, who had opened the webinar. Dear partners, good morning. I am Jonas Abimana. I am the executive director of the Bureau for Information, Training and talking about education and emergencies in the DRC. We have lost sound. Unfortunately, the interpreter has lost sound. Ça a été coupé, on dirait. Partenaire, bonjour. Je m'appelle Jonas Habimana. Je suis directeur exécutif de l'organisation. Again, good morning, partners. I'm an executive director from the Bureau for Information Training and Collaboration, BIFERD, which is based in the Democratic Republic of Congo. As you know, we're going to be talking about education and emergencies in the DRC. So the crisis began in March of 2022 up till date. More than 177 children have been affected by the crisis. Schools have been occupied by displaced people. The schools were used and have been used by displaced persons, and even some have been occupied by armed groups. And there are a lot of terrible cases and impact on education, given the number of children who are out of school today. Despite the situation, our organization has really fought for children's education through advocacy actions that we put in place in collaboration with other actors, such as UNICEF, and others, we have really worked together to continue to advocate. And today, in certain areas occupied by armed groups, we have found that a good number of schools have resumed. It is true, some children have experienced setbacks, but there are some schools where lessons have resumed, and this, of course, is the breast for a lot of children. Uh, in our organization, we have distributed more than 106,000 school kits to children. We have already distributed over 2,040 kits to teachers and over 340 hygiene and sanitation kits to schools in the areas that are occupied by our groups. But of course, our organization continued to train parents, teachers, and we continue to, of course, organize training of trainers. I remember we trained more than 50 teachers on education in emergencies, on peace education, conflict sensitive education, child centered uh, pedagogy, and psychosocial support. And of course, these sessions were carried out with BFER and education inspectors from the education subdivisions in the areas where we worked. Uh, the advocacy work continued still. Just thanks to this, we have been able to mobilize funding from other partners. Today, we have funding from the humanitarian fund that we have already mobilized to set up temporary learning spaces in areas where people are displaced. But also, we continue to raise awareness to train teachers and to distribute skills and there are some areas where we haven't been able to touch between January, February, and March. It's also important to note that our organization is very active in coordination mechanisms because we take part in education cluster meetings. We are also the lead organization of the working group on education in Rushtu territory, which is one of the territories that was badly affected by the current crisis. I therefore think 
that it's important today for us to appeal to all the stakeholders in education so that together in solidarity we can help children who are out of school and this is a real emergency thank you thank you very much to jonas without much ado i'm going to give the floor to our colleague edmund shamba who is education at uh Danish refugee comes so Edmund. I hope you have a good network. Hello, Edmund, go ahead. Um, I apologize. I may not be able to have my camera on, so I'll just continue with audio. I am Edmond Shamba. I am the program manager of the education program of DRC in Ituri in Congo. Here, we have a program in education and protection in two provinces, Nituri and North Kivu. In Nituri, we uh, are active in three territories in Mahagi with 14 schools, amongst which four are for displaced people, in Tugu with 12 schools with six in for displaced people, and Tirumu with 16 schools. And here we have also worked and have brought in and been able to support 17,825 children out of which 5,052 children, 6,000 displaced children, 6,000 returned children, and about 6,000 children from the host community. Total about 17,825 children who about follow, who are attending classes in about 42 class schools that were set up by the program since 2021, since 2022. If we move on to the next slide, or the third slide, I think. Edmund, um, I will also want to remind you that if the participants want to know the project in detail, they can, of course, get the slide that you're presenting. In the second point, in the third slide, this would give you the minimal standards of INEE. We in DRC, we make reference to the minimal standards of INEE because we get the community to participate in our actions, particularly in selecting schools, identifying targets, where they participate actively, they are involved in coordination, in monitoring as well. And with some of the basic standards, they participate actively and with the second group of standards, which is access to a learning environment. In line with this, we set up temporary learning environments. We set up toilets. And of course, based on the third INEE standard, we together with the inspectors set up the different classes and we try to look at the classes that we can offer the children and in line with the fourth standard we try to select the teachers in collaboration with the inspectors and we train them we build their capacity and if you look at the fourth and fifth standards, we work in accordance with the laws and policies of the DRC by ensuring that we, we comply with free education. And what are the difficulties that we face when we set up our activities? Some of the activities, some of the difficulties are armed group ac activities and ethnical, ethnic uh, activities that lead to insecurity in the areas where we operate. We have constant displacement of peaceful group of people 
insufficient funding to meet the education needs is also a problem as well as physical access to some of our areas of intervention this is a major problem that we face particularly in certain areas uh, due to security if we move on a bit fourth slide please i'm then going to talk about the continuation and the continuity of our support for children's education now given that we have supported 42 schools uh, for uh, and now there are about 42 schools that have moved from emergency to development of course this is in line with the nexus we have in power international partnership as you may rightly know they that is, they co-fund together with EU that they fund one part with development. We have 14 schools in the territory of Mahagin that have moved from emergency and that are currently supported by INTPA with three major components, access to education for girls and boys, the capacity of trainers, teachers, and also the vocational training. This is an approach that would encourage their economic integration. This is something that we do for development. We have supported professional training centers in about 14 schools to enable youths, young people who have been supported by ECHO, but who have not been able to move on to secondary education due to lack of means because here se secondary school is not free and so you have some people who are not able to continue their secondary education despite the support of echo and these are then the people who are the priority for us when it comes to vocational training in this area To conclude, we have some suggestions to make. In the last slide, given the high number of children out of school due to ethnic and armed conflicts, sufficient funding would be very important to be able to meet the education needs as well as the protection needs in this part of DRC and improve access of all children to an inclusive quality education in safe and protected environments. This is the first suggestion that we want to make. Funding is very important and we are not having enough. We try to guide, support a uh, number of schools, even though we still have a large number of schools who still need our support. This part of DRC, characterized by ethnic and armed conflicts, education that is sense, that takes into account conflict will be very important. So we need to look at the strategies for our education intervention that takes into account conflict. This would enable humanitarian actors to set up their operations by applying the minimal INE standards to enable children to access education, but also by practicing conflict-sensitive education. In a nutshell, this is what we prepared together with Education Emergencies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edmond. And of course, at the end, We'll share the link to the package and the information uh, regarding uh, conflict-sensitive education. Without further ado, I'd like to say a big thank you to all those who have presented and to the people who helped us to get their testimony. And now I'm going to open the floor for participants. Natalie, I don't know if we have questions that are already there so that we can answer them if not yes we have a number of questions already i don't know if you would want me to read them um, uh, yeah i think you can start 
We had a question from Adama from education who thanked you both for the presentation and asked if she could come back regard to talk about how education cluster works in collecting data, but also to implement lessons learned and challenges. And for Gilbert, there was a second question from Mathilde, who asked, what are the actions carried out by GRC to implement the declaration, uh, the, the safe school declaration? Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Thank you very much for uh, your interest in our presentation. What are our processes for working with protection? I think it's worthy of note that in the DRC, um, we work together with child protection on an intersectional basis and we do not consider children without protection of children or without we do not consider education without protecting children you know these are two things that go hand in hand protection de l'enfant à responsabilité child protection il y a un temps et nous travaillons vraiment and we work uh, even in the presentations of our projects even if the education cluster coordinator is not there i'm sure that the education and emergencies aspect is taken into account in the coordination of the protection cluster even in our indicators there are very clearly defined child protection indicators we try to ensure that we continue to monitor and follow schools that are attacked uh, also in case of children that are at risk we have indicators that enable us to carry out almost an almost daily monitoring or a monthly reporting on education in emergencies but of course uh, we look at it closely with child protection in all areas from evaluation planning up until the end of all our activities be it in our coordination cycle or in our projects we try to ensure that education pro progresses and that child protection is cross-cutting in everything that we do in coordination and all our partners. It is for this reason that in our advocacy, uh, at the beginning, we try to highlight that 90% of children that are targeted by protection were children of school age that is we're supposed to be in school therefore together we have targets and we have 20 percent of targeted the children that are going through gender-based violence that are uh, part of the education cluster and so we kind of work in isolation to uh have an impact on all these children so we need to ensure that our actions are cross-cutting to meet the multi-sectoral needs of these children the second question can you remind me of the second question yes of course there's a second question that touched on actions carried out by the drc regarding the implementation of the safe school declaration in schools uh, last week, we are Tanganyika, where we uh, train the members of the education cluster, cluster of Tanganyika, and uh, we had the 
education cluster with the declaration and the guidelines. The work that we do is a work to train actors of the community so that everyone will know that this initiative exists and was endorsed by the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so one action is, first of all, to ensure that we know what is available. And then how then will each actor, a group of actors, make use of it? And what we have been able to show here is that everyone through their different functions should have an action or the other to carry out. But we should know that people in this cluster, of course, through the funding of Save the Children, we had a workshop to take stock of the implementation of this declaration. So the action, of course, is being done vis-a-vis -vis the government, of course, counterparts, but of course, with partners from all those who are involved in education emergencies. Thank you very much, Gilbert. Mariam, do you have anything to add? Unfortunately, we have to. I would have loved to know if Mariam has anything to add. Unfortunately, we have to close the meeting because interpretation will stop. Mariam, do you have anything to add? Yes, thank you very much, Emily. I would like to buttress Gilbert's point. Since 2016, there have been a lot of initiatives, namely roundtables with the participation of various stakeholders. In September 2022, a summit on democracy was organized in the DRC, which aimed at discussing issues around SST. What stakeholders are currently doing is an in-depth work on the dissemination of the declaration itself because we noticed that many people are not familiar with the document and if people do not know the existence of the document then the implementation will not be optimal it's also important to lay emphasis on the monitoring of uh, the commitments taken as part of this declaration. In the 2022 summit, one of the outcome was the creation of a monitoring body to monitor the implementation of SST led by the government and which is responsible for disseminating and follow up the implementation of the SST. We support the body through uh, awareness raising campaigns. Thank you very much, Mariam. I can see Jose, Joseph, that you're raising your hands. I, can, I also know that other questions were written in the chat. Please do send them to us. You can write your question to me and I will share them or I will convey them to the relevant speakers if I can, I will reply to your I will reply to your questions. In September, we'll have the INEE convention. I hope we will address your questions during that event. Thank all the participants for their various contributions. Unfortunately, we have to close this meeting. My apologies for that. We will, however, follow up and organize another INEE gathering. Get in touch. You will receive all rele relevant information on INEE web's web page. And if we can support your technical efforts, we will do that because at NEE, we are ready to support you and 
guide you on how to do things, how to align them with the, stand, the minimal standards. Reach out to us. And if you need to get in to reach out to the cluster members and other speakers, also reach out to us. Thank you, dear colleagues who are working in the background. And I wish you well. Thank you very much for joining. Bye.